I want to be able to go onto my phone, tap a few keys, type in Bozeman, Montana, see a bunch of properties that are listed for sale, and instead of buying any of those properties, instead of making an offer, I want to be able to say, ah, let's see, at $50 a token, I'm going to buy 200 tokens of this property in Bozeman. Imagine how ridiculously powerful that would be. You're imagining tokenization. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 306. We have some incredibly powerful information to share with you today on disruptive forces and trends that will be dramatically altering the course of real estate investing for the next 10 years. And I'm so excited to have Neil Bawa back on the show to share it with us. For those of you who don't know Neil, he is considered the mad scientist of multifamily. And I've been following Neil and his companies Grow Capitus and Multifamily University for years because he takes data science, statistics, and technological advancements and in an amazing and exciting way, forecast trends that very few investors are paying attention to. So prepare yourself for a fascinating conversation because Neil is going to take us through the top 10 disruptive trends that will drive real estate in the coming decade. Neil, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me back, Brian. Excited to be here. You always put together incredible presentations. You make them fun, you make them accessible. And I remember listening to this one a couple months ago, and I'm really just excited to share it with our audience today. So why don't you tell us, like, what, what are you talking about? 10 disruptive trends. What, what does that mean? And, and how would you break that down? First thing I want to tell you is it's, it's imp really impossible on a podcast format to discuss all of them. So what I'm going to do is is when we did this presentation, we had 10 the first time and we got feedback from people. We got feedback on what do you care about You know, when you're listening to these disruptive trends? Which one really caught your attention? Which one did you feel were the biggest ones? Which ones did you feel were you know, further out into the future as opposed to the ones that are here now today? And, and impacting your investment decisions today. So we did, did a poll of that, and we kind of narrowed those down to smaller numbers, which I think I think at this point, maybe some of these are not you know as, as big as the future ones, but today, the ones that are impacting your real estate decisions, your profit, your investors, your mindset, are we basically there's three or four of those, and, and I think that those are the ones that I'd love to discuss. So the, the one that comes up, constantly and and most people when i'm going to say this are like yeah that makes sense but they don't they're not thinking about the impact of it on real estate on real estate profits and that is the concept of hybrid work that's the concept of people now working remotely from home beyond covid whenever it is that covid ends and i think we're we're getting closer to the end here what does that impact mean for me as a real estate investor and my investments in the next 10 years? I think hybrid work is huge. And, and we got massive feedback. You know, we, there about 10,000 people have watched this presentation and the biggest feedback, wow, this hybrid work thing, the way you laid it out was phenomenal. So I want to talk more about that. I have new, uh, fresh data from yesterday about the impact of hybrid work and how it's affecting and changing the way that big companies, not small ones, but huge branded companies, how they're changing the way that they do things and how it's going to impact the workforce in the future. And what does that mean to real estate profits? The second one is one that I'm even more excited about. And I got so much feedback on this second disruptive trend that I'm doing an entire presentation on it. Because all I have, you know, when, when I'm doing a presentation that's 10 disruptive trends and I have about 40 minutes and five minutes of that is introduction. I really have three and a half minutes to talk about one trend. And so I regretted that this one trend, I had three and a half minutes to talk about. Of course, I got bombarded at the end in terms of questions. And I was like, this one, I think has to get its own, you know, 40 minute presentation. And that trend is tokenization 
and its impact on real estate. And I'll talk more about this, but tokenization is a process of taking a real estate property, whether it's a multifamily or it's a storage property, or it's even a parking lot, and chopping it up into $100 or $50 bits and then selling it on the internet like stock, stock that's exchangeable, right? So now instead of buying you know, a $100,000 syndication share in an illiquid multifamily property that belongs to Neil Bawa, you know, you're basically buying tokens and exchanging them just like you exchange stocks. So any day that you feel bad about the investment, you can go and sell your tokens that day. And, and then 10 days later, you regret it and you can buy them all back just like we buy stock. And that tokenization, I think, is a such an astonishingly powerful thing. And, and the thing that it does is it changes the face of real estate, both for the better and for the worse. And so that's, you know, I'd love to talk about those two. And you know, beyond that, there's a few things that I'd lo love to talk about. And one of that is suburbanization and, and how COVID has impacted suburbanization. And, you know, we call them true tertiary metros and what the impact of that is. I think these three, if, if we can just dive down these three, I think that they were like 80% of the juice of that presentation. Let, let's do that. Let's dive down, do a deep dive into these three, starting with hybrid work. I know that I've heard a lot about how that's going to affect the office space and people's return to the office, but how does it affect us as a multifamily investors? A lot of people have heard that technology companies are saying, maybe you don't need to come into the office five days a week. Sorry about that shine on the face here. And, and you know, they're like, yeah, this is going to end, you know, you know, when, when this, you know, goes away, these tech companies are going to call everybody back into the office. Nothing's really going to change. And they couldn't be more wrong. So for the moment, I'm simply not going to talk about technology companies because everyone thinks that tech companies have employees that are sitting in their cubicles and typing and doing code and, you know, they can work from anywhere. Not true. The biggest companies in the US that have white collar workers are not technology companies. So I'm going to give you the example of a company that most of you know. So remember that snafu, that problem at the Oscars where they opened the wrong, you know, the, like the best movie winning, they, they had the wrong envelope and they basically announced the wrong movie and then they had to correct themselves. They announced La La Land as the winner and it was really moonlight. Exactly. Right. Remember that disaster. Right. So, so the company who was in charge of the envelopes and is, has always been in charge of the envelopes for decades is a company called Price Waterhouse Cooper. Price Waterhouse Cooper is not a technology company. They have 50 plus thousand employees. Of those 100,000 employees, they've made an announcement. This is this week on CNN. They said, we're going to allow 40,000 of these employees to work from home forever. Important word forever, not from home, forever. This is the way our company is now going to work. These 40,000 people, we've analyzed their jobs and we feel like they can work from home. And so we're just going to let them work from home. They made a second announcement and they said, we're going to do a major ESG, which is environmental, social, governmental. ESG is a new nickname for you know companies doing things socially correctly. And we're going to hire 100,000 new employees. Right. And the vast majority of those employees will be able to work from home. And once again, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Imagine this is an accounting firm. They are super duper. They're going to be extremely, extremely conservative because that's what accounting companies are. So they deal with people's social security numbers and their K-1s, their tax returns, all kinds of confidential stuff. And they're OK with 40,000 of their employees never coming into the office. Right. This is not a technology company. This is one of the most conservative firms in the U.S. It's a branded company that everybody knows. And they're saying 40,000 of our people will never come back to the office. Do you understand how big a deal it is when old school companies keep saying that this has completely changed the, the way that we do business forever? And this is just one company. I could list a dozen companies that have nothing to do with Google and Apple and Microsoft and Facebook and, you know, LinkedIn. Those, those are the people that have announced, hey, you know, our staff doesn't need to come back. And even when they come back, you know, they, they, they blah, blah, blah. What is happening here is so big, so humongous that most of the people listening are going to have trouble wrapping their heads around it. So here are a few big numbers. Let me, let me see if I can kind of quantify the size of this gigantic asteroid that's just hitting the way we do work in the United States, right? This is like that, the one that killed the dinosaurs. That's how big this asteroid is. 
If you look at the U.S., our population is 330 million people, and roughly 200 million of those people work, right, in some capacity, full-time, part-time. Now, of those people, roughly 80 million are white-collar workers. Essentially, we work with computers or we work with paper, right, of some sort, and we work, typically, we work in an office. Of those people, the most conservative estimate that I can put you is that COVID has freed 22 million. 22 million people out of that 80 million that work with paper, this is the most conservative estimate. Some people are saying, no, 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 it's as much as 60 million out of those, you know, 80 million paper pushers, code pushers, computer workers. But I'm going to take the lowest estimate. I'm going to say, no, you're all wrong. It's just 22 million out of 80 that have been freed from their jobs. And those 22 million, two things have happened for them. Number one, The companies that they work in are saying, sure, you can work from home. And number two, these are people who feel like they want to work from home. That's why I've kind of gotten it down from 60 million to 22 million. Because, you know, there may be some people that are like, I just love going to the office. Water cooler is my thing. You know, I don't want to change anything. You know, who am I going to, you know, bitch and moan and complain about, you know, if I don't go to the office? So there's people there that are substantial. That's why I went all the way down to 22 million. I think that's super conservative. Those are 22 million people who have choices of working from home and want to work from home. 22 million people that are white collar workers with high incomes is a massive tsunami. It's a 1000 foot wave about to hit the United States. And these people will not all make decisions to work from home this year. In fact, there's evidence that only about 2 million out of these 22 million have already made that move. And all of the crazy stuff that we've seen in the last 12 months, the massive churn, the you know, ridiculous amount of movement, the U-Haul being so happy that everyone's moving, all of that is 2 million out of those 22 million people. And when these people are freed up, they're going to make decisions to live in different places. They're going to make decisions, all kinds of strange decisions. Some of them will move to Hawaii. Some of them will move to Puerto Rico. Some of them will move to Bozeman, Montana. And these are obviously beautiful places. But then some of them will simply move to suburbs of their own cities. Instead of living 20 or 30 or 40 minutes from San Francisco, they'll live 90 minutes from San Francisco because they still want to be in that metro because, you know, the pay grades post COVID, the pay grades are structured. They're tied to where you live. So if you, you know, move from San Francisco to Phoenix, they're going to give you a big pay cut. But if you live within the San Francisco Bay Area, but as far out as they will allow you and, and still have it be counted as a San Francisco Bay Area. Maybe that's Modesto. That's about 80 miles away. Now people are going to move to Modesto because they're working from home. And Modesto has beautiful, large, inexpensive homes compared to San Francisco, where garages cost a million, right? So now you have the ability to stay within your metro, get paid according to the metro's levels, and go out and live 80 miles away. So they'll move to the suburbs. Or they'll move to true tertiaries. These are not beautiful places. They're not gorgeous looking. They're not Hawaii or Bozeman, Montana. But they're places that are somehow you are connected to. Maybe you were born there. Maybe your parents were born there. Maybe your family lives there. Like Idaho Falls or Dalton, Georgia. These are places that are not naturally beautiful. They're nice. You know, Idaho Falls is a very nice place. But it's, you know, it's, it's flat land. But you always wanted to go live in Idaho because it has great, you know, good climate, blah, blah, blah. And now you can make that happen. Very few of these people, very, very few of them are going to say, I want to go live in a dense place like downtown Atlanta or downtown New York or downtown San Francisco. So they're going to make these moves and they're going to make these moves in waves. We've, the first wave has already hit. And the second wave is now beginning to hit because people are now clear on which companies are going to do this forever and which companies are only, you know, not setting policies in. Like PricewaterhouseCooper, when you say the word forever in a press release, you're done. You can't take that back, right? So now what's happening is every day another company, another big company says this, uses the word forever. So that the now the second wave is beginning 
as the forever press releases, as I call them, come out. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is healthcare for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. What I hear you saying then is everything we've seen so far of people working from home, people moving out of the denser city, you know, inner city areas to the suburbs, that's just the tip of the iceberg, what we've seen so far. It's the trailer for the movie. The movie hasn't started yet, right? Because of those 22 million completely freed up, wanting to be free people, I don't think that the math suggests that we've seen more than one or two million people, right? So it could be one, could be two million, but I don't, I, I, there's no data supporting that it's higher than that. So now you're going to just start seeing waves and waves of these people move, whether they move to the distant suburbs or they move to the true tertiaries or they move to the beautiful places, they're going to move and they're going to change the face of real estate. So what does that mean to us as real estate investors? Well, the first thing is that if you look at the next 10 years, the worst place to be as a real estate investor is dense metros. And there's going to be people who are going to defend that and say, no, people have come back. They've come back, you know, in the last six months, dense metros are positive again. Rent growth is better. And my answer is yes, but you're only watching the trailer. And those people that left New York had to come back to New York. They had leases. They had obligations. They had furniture. They had diapers stored, you know. So this doesn't happen overnight. They came back because now they can and their, their, their work is either open or, or whatever. They haven't made that life decision yet. So you are going to see this is, as a bumpy road. But as those people start making life decisions by the millions, I believe that the worst place in the next 10 years is going to be downtowns or sometimes they call them central business district or they call them dense infill. I think these are all horrible places to be in. Because something else is coming that hasn't happened yet. Imagine an event happens that basically simultaneously impacts 7 billion people. By the way, no event in history has ever done this before. And you might be thinking World War II. The answer is no. There were hundreds of millions of people that didn't even know that a world war was going on in 1939 to 1945. They lived so far from it that they weren't impacted. But there are no people at this point of time on this planet that are not impacted by this. If you live in Siberia, you're impacted by COVID. So when 7 billion people were impacted, guess what technology companies did? Technology companies said, we're going to make working from home cooler, better, faster. You know, And now there's hundreds of post-COVID startups that are doing everything from three-dimensional holographic cameras to better audio, to better you know, backgrounds, to all kinds of things so that Instead of you and me, right now, the problem right now is I can see Brian. He's sitting there. He's got this nice background. And he can see me. I'm using a virtual background. But we're not sitting in the same room. And there's right now 100 startups obsessed with making us virtually sit in the same Starbucks, the same office room. And I believe they're going to be successful within the next two or three years because billions are going into that. Billions. 
right? If you're a venture capital right now and somebody comes to you and says, I've got this idea so I can put Brian and Neil right now in the same room virtually. So they, it feels like they're talking to each other and I can stick six other people into that room and everyone feels and looks like they're sitting. Brian's not facing Neil. Neil's not facing Brian. They're all around the conference table. And I, and I can make this seamless. That VC is just going to ask one question. How many million am I cutting the check for? That's the only question. And so when you see this happening, you're going to see moves happening. So yeah, back to your question, right? What does this mean? I've told you where not to be, right? So now let's talk about where to be. Well, depending upon your own beliefs, you can be in one of three places. One, distant suburbs. So if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're going out to Modesto. You're going out to Stockton. That's far, right? You'd not really even consider those to be part of the San Francisco Bay Area. So imagine the circle around a major metro like San Francisco, Los Angeles, or New York. Now expand that circle by 30 miles. Make the circle bigger by 30 miles in all directions. And everything in that circle is worth more than everything inside of it in terms of profit growth in the next 30 miles, right? Now, so that's number one. Maybe, maybe that's where you want to go, what, what you're comfortable with. Great. There's lots of profit. We, we call it the ring of profit, the new 30-mile ring of profit. The second thing is maybe you want to change your life yourself, and you want to go live in a beautiful place like Bozeman, Montana, or you want to go live in a beautiful place like Destin, Florida, and you've been thinking about it, and you didn't have a business case for living in Destin, Florida. Now you do, because I think that anything that is beautiful that is good looking is going to be growing faster for the next five to 10 years. I don't have any particular state to give you because every state has such beautiful places. You can just pick one that you like. And now you have a business case. Brian Hamrick is moving to this beautiful place. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep using Bozeman as my, my uh, example. And he's not doing it because Brian wants to live in Bozeman. He's doing it because he knows Bozeman will grow faster than most other places in the United States for the next five years. Now, whether that's a true reason for you to move or you just like living in Bozeman, the fact of the matter is millions of Americans are going to think they're moving to improve their life because those areas are going to grow faster. And that's going to make those places absolutely explode. So that's those places. The third one is true tertiaries. Idaho Falls, you know, Dalton, Georgia, Jacksonville. These are places that are far away from every other place. They're hours and hours and hours away from anything else. St. George, Utah is a good hybrid because it's a true tertiary. Las Vegas is actually closer to St. George, Utah than Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is about three and a half hours away. Las Vegas is about two and a half hours away. And there's nothing around it. So it's a true tertiary, but it also fits into the second category in that it's beautiful. So St. George, Utah should do phenomenally well because it fits into two out of those three profit-making categories. I think an incredible amount of money is to be made in these places. Now, I do not suggest that this means that, you know, downtown Phoenix is going to fall apart, that there's going to be, you know, fire sales, nothing like that. I'm simply talking about where do you get faster growth where compared to slower growth? I think that if, what, what's going to happen is as you project outward from metros, like Phoenix, for example, downtown, right? Now it's a better idea to go 30 miles away from Phoenix and not stop worrying about the fact that, well, I'm too far from the city. We are investing in Phoenix on the one side in Mesa, which is about 30 minutes southeast. And then we're investing in Avondale, which is 30 minutes due west. And we have no intention of investing inside Phoenix itself. We, we're all looking for that ring to get bigger. Where are we looking next based on the, these numbers? We're looking at Maricopa. Maricopa is a city that is about 40 minutes south. And it's just sort of by itself because in between are Indian reservations. So there's really nothing. It's just a road, an empty road. And we're looking at 45 minutes west to the city of Buckeye, which is not even really a city. It's a town of Buckeye. And Bill Gates bought all the land around it to build the world's first electronic or you know, digital city. And so we're looking at Buckeye. And we're more interested in doing Maricopa or Buckeye than we are interested in doing Phoenix. So we're you know, eating our own dog food. And that's what I'm trying to talk about, that there's a lot of money to be made there because of hybrid, hybrid work. And we can talk about all the other ways of making money. But when it comes to hybrid work, those three are the big ones. Wow. So that, that's a lot to take in. And just to be clear, you're not 
predicting the demise of the metro areas like New York City or anything. You're just saying the growth is going to slow down because people are moving out. I think, you know, big cities continue to, to grow for other reasons. But I think that one of the biggest magnets to big cities was expensive, well-paying jobs and expensive, well-paying jobs are over the next five or 10 years going to even out. Not all jobs will be gone. Some, some CEOs are happy to be back in the office and some CEOs, their life has changed. This isn't about people, Brian. The world is run today by CEOs and COVID, much as it trained 7 billion people to react in a different way, it trained 300 million CEOs. That's 30 to 50 years of hybrid work training for CEOs forced on them. And a certain percentage of them liked it. A certain percentage of them realized that their companies actually run better, right? Why would Price Waterhouse Coopers do this? And you know what, they, what their press release says? They say, we have a talent war to win. And today, the best way to win the talent war is to offer work from home. Can you imagine that? The most talented Americans, the ones that are the movers and shakers, the ones that will make the biggest decisions, the ones that will make the biggest discoveries, are the ones being offered this opportunity. So the talent is simply going to go in the direction of working from home, which means that the talent, America's talents, the smartest minds now can roam free. And that's a big deal because if a substantial percentage of those end up in St. George, Utah, imagine what happens to St. George, Utah. Because if $1 billion company opens in St. George, Utah, it completely changes the top, right? I mean, there was a company, I can't remember their name, that created Silicon Slopes, the portion of Utah that's between Salt Lake City and Provo. Provo now is this incredible tech juggernaut, right? And it came from one con company, oh, Novell. Novell was the company in the, in the 90s. They were a bigger deal in, than Microsoft in, in some areas. And then as Novell sort of dipped, other companies opened up and, and changed you know, Provo completely. One company changes these small cities because they're so small. Dell was, Austin was changed by Dell. Dell opened up business in 1994. Now Austin is unquestionably the most powerful, fast-growing tech city in America. But it all really started from Michael Dell saying, I'm going to open a, a factory in, in Austin. So, and Austin even then was a big city compared to St. George or Idaho Falls, right? So the impact of America's smartest having the ability to move to these places is going to be absolutely spectacular. And you want to be part of that. So I'd love to continue talking about hybridization and how that's one of the disruptive trends, but we have a couple others that we need to make sure we get to. So you brought up tokenization. Let's let's switch gears and talk about that. You know, does that have anything to do with cryptocurrency or is that a completely different technology? I think it does and it doesn't, right? So think about this. I'm going to make a statement. It takes 1000 times more work to buy property than to buy stock, right? So think about it. Most people have some kind of phone app that is, you know, if they're in the stock market, so they've got, you know, something, you know, I use E-Trade, some people use Robinhood. And typically when I get a tip, like I'm, I'm on a podcast and Brian says, oh, there's this company, it's pretty awesome, Neil. You know, I can tap on my phone and the process of buying stock of that company is probably about a two minute process. Fair enough, right? I'll, I'll call it five minutes. Now multiply five minutes and by a thousand. That's five thousand minutes, or basically eighty or ninety hours. And I'm being kind to real estate when I say that it only takes eighty hours to buy real estate. Because if you think about it, whether you're a buying two hundred unit multifamilies or you're buying one single family, right? Maybe a rental. Eighty hours is really a lot less than you would take. You know researching, flying, going, making offers, getting your offers rejected, then making more offers, buying the properties, closing, doing escrow, getting loans, and then rehabbing the property and then putting in the market and then you know firing your first property manager and then finally stabilizing. I think it's more like 800 hours, which would mean that real estate is 10,000 times more difficult than stock. And this is why real estate more, makes more money. You know, Brian Hamrick says it, Neil Bawa says it, real estate makes more money than stocks. We know that to be true because we can look at the last 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, it always makes more money. And so the question is, then why doesn't everybody do real estate instead of stock if it clearly makes more money? The answer is stock is easier. So 
But for decades, people in real estate have been trying various different things to make real estate as liquid as stocks, to have the equivalent of Robinhood, or maybe Robinhood is the app where you, I go in, and because Neil Bauer has been talking about Bozeman, Montana, and Idaho Falls, I want to be able to go onto my phone, tap a few keys, type in Bozeman, Montana, see a bunch of properties that are listed for sale, and instead of buying any of those properties, instead of making an offer, I want to be able to say, ah, let's see, at $50 a token, I'm going to buy 200 tokens of this property in Bozeman, and then I'm going to buy another 5,000 tokens of this property in Idaho Falls. And in about 15 minutes, I've already, I I now own in Idaho Falls, I own in Bozeman, Montana, I I own in all these different places, St. George, I'm done, 15, 20 minutes. Imagine how sick, imagine how ridiculously powerful that would be. Imagining, you're imagining tokenization. You're imagining the ability that now exists. And this is real, not future. I'm going to give you an example in a minute of a company that's doing it right now. I get their emails. I got one this morning where they're taking single families and other people are doing multifamilies. There's a company doing parking garages. There's a company doing hotels. And this is all really the first year where they're taking an asset and putting it online where people can buy this asset for 50 bucks. And you might say, this looks like crowdfunding. No, no, it's not crowdfunding. Because what they've done is they've tied this concept of tokenization, which is really just chopping it up into 50 or $100 bits. And they've tied it to, to another very powerful concept called blockchain, right? Which is, you know, a blockchain is tied to cryptocurrencies because Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency uses the blockchain and so do all of the others. So by tying these two together, what they're attempting to do is to create a true liquid online interface where you trade this money. When I use crowdfunding to buy a $50,000 share in Brian Hamrick's property in Jacksonville, there's really no way for me to sell that, right? Until Brian sells the property, I'm captive. There's no liquidity in crowdfunding. But the whole concept of tokenization from the very beginning is that you should be able to go grab a bunch of tokens, 50 bucks each, 100 bucks each, and then be able to transact them just like stock. And obviously, that's not there yet. We're not quite there yet. We can buy tokens. Like there's a company called Lofty, L O F T Y, Lofty.ai. I'm not connected with them in any way. That basically is buying homes in Rust Belt places like you know, St. Louis and Detroit and Cleveland. And every day they send you an email and say, hey, would you like to buy a portion of this house? And they're not even using leverage. They're just simply buying these homes and you can just buy them and, and start getting a portion of rents. And you might say, wow. How do they do that? How do they give distribute this to me? Well, that's the technology where they basically take this home and take all of its profits and they figure out how to slice that up into tokens. And they do that in a way that they can't cheat you. You might say, why do they might just keep all the money? No, they can't because they have to use third party tokenization systems. And those t- systems are designed to prevent you from getting screwed. Because when you buy Apple stock, the last thing you're thinking about is, is Apple going to screw me and keep all of the profit and not send me any of my dividends? You don't think that because there are systems and processes and laws and third-party companies in place to prevent Apple from just sticking it to you, right? In the same way, those systems, those processes, that infrastructure for tokenization is being built in real time. I can tell you this five years from now, and this is bad news, by the way, for some of the people that are listening here. I'd say five years from now, There's going to be plenty of multifamilies, which will be tokenized on the blockchain. And that's how money will be raised. And 10 years from now, the number of syndicators that exist in the United States is going to fall to a tenth or less of what it is today. Because the reason why there's 10,000 syndicators is simply because real estate is illiquid. The illiquidity of real estate creates opportunity. The best way to give you this example is 1970s, there are tens of thousands of or hundreds of thousands of grocery stores in the US. Flash forward 30 years later, all of those neighborhood stores don't exist anymore. The, some of them upscaled and became chains themselves. And so they managed to survive that way. But in their 
previous shape. They don't exist anymore. So we had the Walmart effect happen, and it took 30 years to do that. But in, in the digital era, it'll take 10 years to go from today's real estate, completely illiquid, real estate is sold through transactions, to becoming completely liquid, where real estate is sold through tokens. And when that happens, the opportunity for syndicators actually somewhat decreases. So I'm going to say a significant portion of our real syndicator brethren will either be gone or will upscale, meaning they'll change, they'll become something different within the next 10 years. So that's tokenization. Now, I only gave you the bad part of tokenization. So let me, you know, before I know, Brian, you have questions. Let me give you the good part. Every asset which has become liquid in the last 50 years, its value has gone up very sharply. So we do expect in the next 10 years for real estate to go up to stock multiples. So all these bragging that you and I do about real estate making more money than stock, that's going to be gone. Real estate will just make as much money as stock because it's, it's a traded asset. It doesn't have any benefits. But on the other hand, the people holding real estate in the next 10 years are going to see a gigantic increase in value as their illiquid asset becomes a liquid asset class. So hold as much real estate as you possibly can over the next 10 years because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to go from an illiquid asset to a liquid asset class. Wow, that's an incredible technology. It sounds like you're seeing that being done now. And are you going to be incorporating that? Because I know you bring a number of opportunities to investors as a sponsor. When do you see yourself incorporating that technology? It is a question of when. So it's not a question of if for me. I mean, this is one of those cases where if we keep doing what we are doing, we could do it for another two or three years without significant consequence. But beyond that point, if we don't do it, we're just going to die. Right? So we're the grocery store, right? So, you know, when Walmart opened up for a while, the grocery stores were like, eh, you know, our, our, everybody loves us in the neighborhood. We're the local water cooler. People want to come here. They want to share things. And it took them a while before they figured out that they were dinosaurs. It's going to take us a while to figure out, you know, that we're dinosaurs. So are, am I going in that direction? Absolutely. When is really the key question. What kind of asset makes more sense? So I'm learning. I'm watching. I'm doing presentations. What's the biggest reason I do presentations? Other people get attracted to me and come and, you know, firstly, they call me out on something that I've started that's complete bullshit. So they come back and say, let me correct you on this so that I get free education. And then what happens is other people that have similar ideas get attracted to me, right? And that attraction usually leads to a partnership that leads to me getting more education and more traction in this space. So I'm talking about it. Haven't done anything just yet. But I'd be shocked if two to three years from now, I hadn't already dipped my toe in the water, maybe even sooner than that. If I read between the lines, it sounds like you are talking to someone who's in that space who you might be able to work together with to tokenize an opportunity. Several people, actually. That's the best way to learn. If these are people that spend all of their time in the tokenization world, and I'm spending all of my time in the syndication world, I think I should spend some time with them. You said the third most disruptive trend that really fascinates people has to do with suburbanization. Talk about that a little bit. I briefly mentioned it before, right? So this concept that you know we talk about, you talk about, I talk about is you know people are running away from California and they're going to Phoenix and Boise. They are. They're running away from California and going to Austin. But when you look at the raw numbers post-COVID, you look at the raw numbers and say, how many of these Californians actually ran away to, you know, to, to Austin and Phoenix and Boise? The numbers are not as big as you might think they are. It's certainly impressive that hundreds of thousands of Californians are running away. Clearly, there's a trend there. But you know where millions of Californians are going? They're going away from their main metro. They're going further away. They're not leaving California. So even though California's population is not growing, it's not necessarily shrinking at this point. And so this 30-mile ring is really key. I think that the challenge that these suburbs have is that they're lacking the downtowns. They're lacking the high-quality restaurants. They're lacking the entertainment that you get from San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York. And so the big opportunity that I see is over the next you know, 10 years, and this may reverse, by the way, in about 10 years because of a massive trend called, you know, called automated cars, self-driving vehicles. So it might, it might change in, in strange ways that I don't understand yet. 
But over the next 10 years, what I expect happening is that not only are we going to see people moving to these suburban areas, but these suburban areas will transform. And they're going to transform using a term that was coined by John Zahed. This term is very interesting because it truly describes what's about to happen. These areas, these suburban areas, are going to become suburban. Suburban, right? So you're, it, it's a mashup of suburbia and urban. So the world is now going from the concept of every city has a downtown, right? Or at least every city aspires to build a downtown. I live in Fremont, 212,000 people know downtown. So that city is trying to do a downtown. We're going to switch to a concept where for every 40 or 50,000 people that are in maybe a three or four mile radius, they're going to build a smaller downtown. And that smaller downtown, that concept is going to be known as suburban. And so this downtown basically is not huge. It's not a massive street. It's basically just one or two iconic buildings with, with retail under them and maybe a hotel or two. And then basically people in that area are going to go to their suburban downtown as opposed to going to the, the big downtown that the city has. So call it Basically, what, what, you know, another way of looking at it is every city in America is going to see a mushrooming of mini downtowns. And I think there's a tremendous profit uh, opportunity in these because for this, people's life doesn't really have to change. They're just moving from being 30 miles from San Francisco to being 70 miles from San Francisco. They still have access to San Francisco when they want to go see Hamilton because Hamilton's only playing in downtown San Francisco. And that's, you know, so you have to drive in. And, and maybe when they want to fly internationally, they still have to drive to San Francisco International. But for the rest of the time, they have their own downtowns. These mini downtowns are going to be incredibly powerful. So the call for you is pick a city that you think is a suburban city, right? Maybe it's a city that's you know, further away from Atlanta. So maybe you pick you know, Fayetteville. And then you figure out and go, hmm, okay, so this is a nice bedroom community. But I know this suburban thing is going to happen. So I want to go and find out where the city of Fayetteville is going to focus its new downtown. Because in the past, people, cities have tried downtowns, but this time they have a, this time things are different because of COVID, right? Now there's a real reason to build downtowns in these sleepy, sleepy little second tier, third tier cities and be, build multiple downtowns. So now you go and talk to the city and the city says, well, between this street and this street, we've designated this area and we're spending, you know, $150 million to, to make this work. Don't immediately say, I'm going to go buy something there. You want to go and have that conversation with 10 different cities. And you'll notice that some cities are much further ahead of others. Some cities are doing bonds. Like Mesa, Arizona, for example, they created a corridor called the Silicon Alley. And, and in that corridor, they bought in fiber optics. And before they knew it, you know, some tiny companies like Apple and Google had built you know, mega data centers in this area because the, the fiber was there and it was cheap. The electricity was cheap. So they did a lot. And then they took their urban area and connected it to that corridor at one end, right? So, and then they put a huge amount of money. Maybe they got, they borrowed money, they took bonds. So the cities that are really putting their money where their mouth is, these smaller cities like Mesa, Arizona, are going to see astonishing growth. You're going to be able to piggyback on not one, but two different trends, the suburbia concept, and then the, the work from home or, or you know, hybrid work concept. You piggyback on two, you're going to make a filthy amount of money. So what is the value potential there then, or the, the investment potential? Is it buying up existing stock of residential? Is it being a developer? Or is it a land play? I mean, where do you see the opportunity? Oh, no, I don't think it's a land play. And I also don't think it's a development opportunity. So one of the things is, you know, for your podcast, you know, Brian, I'm not thinking that these people are all going to turn development. I never recommend development to people because it's so dangerous and so complicated. So the opportunity is, you know, think beyond the multifamily because this area that's been designated may not have multifamily. So the first thing you should do is not think, oh, I'm going to be the one that's going to basically buy land in here. I'm going to demolish whatever's in there and then I'm going to build a multifamily. Please don't do that. I'm not saying that. That's dangerous. That's risky. You have to have a lot of skills and a lot of people. What I'm saying is something much simpler. Well, look at what is in there and make a fund to buy those things that are there and don't build anything simply don't build anything make little changes to make that piece of land 
more lucrative for some other developer. Because if you do the whole development thing, you're tied in for five years on, on recourse loans and all kinds of trouble that I've had to deal with as a developer. But what if you were to just buy that piece of land and then buy another piece of land in another city and another piece of land? And when I say piece of land, it probably has something on it. Maybe it's got single family homes. Maybe it's got industrial. When you talk to the city, the city will say things like, we are going to encourage taking this industrial land and convert it because we're building a downtown. We don't want any kind of industrial in downtown. So we're going to give you the ability to convert it. When you take industrial land and convert it to multifamily, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? I mean, you're done at that point in time. You don't build a multifamily. You, you, you simply create an architectural rendering, which is much simpler, of a multifamily, and you build it. As you sell it to some developer. You've already done your do job. You've done rezoning. So what I'm suggesting is that the biggest play is simply sitting on assets. And it's not land asset, because I can tell you wherever they've designated this area, it's not going to be land. There's that, that area is going to be filled in. It's going to be infill. But you're basically saying, what's a cheap asset here that is going to appreciate greatly? I'm going to buy that. Nice. Thank you for that. So in the interest of time, in the introduction, Neil, I said we're going to talk about the top 10. And with respect to the three that you just really gave us a lot of incredible information on, can you go through the other seven just so our listeners know what to look out for, even if they just hear the term? I won't go through all 10 of them because some of them are really far out into the future and, and we're really meant to kind of tickle the fancy and think about what happens in the future. So rent growth. So, you know, it is our expectation based on the data that rent growth in the United States will be substantially stronger of course, you know, we did this presentation many months ago and we've already been proven right with three of the greatest four rent growth months in history coming after this presentation was written. But we expect that not to change. We expect that there's going to be bumps up and down. But over the next five years, rent growth in the United States will be at least double what it has been traditionally. And I include the last decade, which was pretty strong in that. So, you know, I think rent growth is, is going to be absolutely phenomenal in the U.S. for the right kind of asset classes. 15-minute cities is something that I want you to Google. It's a future concept. It's not here yet, but I think it's going to reshape the way that we, we do cities. So that's a, that's a terrific one. Another one is the staycation, the renaissance of the staycation. We're going from you know staycationing in places like Tahoe and Aspen to staycationing in places closer to home because we've been Mentally impacted. Seven billion people were impacted. So look up the renaissance of the staycation. I think that there's a lot of money to be made there for Airbnb folks. And those are the kind of the big ones that I'm, you know, remembering at this point that I wanted to tell you about. I think the, the big three really in my mind, the ones that we discussed today, they're the big ones. They're the ones that you really need to go after. Now, for those of you that want to watch all 10 of these, we do have a recording of the presentation. And so the entire presentation with all 10 of them, or maybe seven of them, we, we did trim a few of them based on feedback, is on the homepage of multifamilyu.com. So you go to multifamilyu.com, you see the presentation there, check it out. You know, we currently have a $500 million portfolio, 22 properties. We're adding another three properties in the, in the coming two months. A lot of our future is bet on what's in this presentation. So it's not academic. It's not a this is some cool thing that some you know, professor, tenured professor in some university wrote. This is what we believe is going to happen. And all of the measures that we're taking in the future, we're taking based on that. For example, we're buying properties in Metro. In, right now, I'm buying, I won't name the Metro, but it's 67 miles. 67 miles. That's a pretty substantial distance, wouldn't you say? It's 67 miles from a superstar city. And it's considered really an armpit. And we're buying it because we know that it can't stay in armpit. Nice. You do incredible presentations. And I, I highly recommend our listeners to go to multifamilyu.com. And multifamilyu, that's the letter U, not Y-O-U, multifamilyu.com. Check out the presentations. You did one on climate change and how it's going to impact investment real estate. And A, that was just an incredible presentation. And B, I don't know why you don't include it as one of the top 10 disruptive trends, because the impact from climate change, as you discussed, is just going to be devastating in some areas and then push people to other areas. Why isn't that included in your top 10 disruptive trends? So firstly, because climate change was a standalone presentation, the people that follow us watched it simply, it was a hugely watched presentation. So it had its own slot, so to speak, right? 
The second thing was disruptive trends was we excluded everything that doesn't have immediate actionable items in the next two years. Okay. And as a result, we, we took climate change out because we are not ourselves convinced that the actionable items are coming in the next two years, certainly in the next five years. I mean, cap rates are already changing in places that have you know severe flooding. We're seeing that happening in Louisiana and other places. So watch the presentation. It's pretty powerful. But the reason it was separated from the 10 disruptive trends was we can't say for sure that in the next two years, we ourselves will act on it. In the five-year time frame, I think we'll act on it. In the 10-year time frame, everyone in America that's in our position will be forced to act on. It. So it's a massive tsunami, but it's also a slow-moving one. Any upcoming presentations that you want to tease? Well, absolutely. I am going to take the tokenization one, and I'm going to turn it into a full 40-minute presentation. I'm going to share thoughts on the big losers in real estate, the big winners in real estate. What are the companies that are already moving towards it? What are their names? What are the companies that are taking an existing business model and saying, hmm, you know, I'm a syndicator. Why don't I do this? And if I do that, I'm going to be a pioneer and I'm going to have some benefits that you know somebody else may not have. And how are those companies becoming venture capitals, darling, and taking dollar revenue from, from syndication, which really has no value other than the project itself, and they're turning it into $10 by creating valuation for their companies. Remember, Brian Hamrick's company doesn't have intrinsic value itself. It's Brian Hamrick's projects that have intrinsic, intrinsic value. Well, for the first time as a syndicator, that's no longer true. You can have a company with intrinsic value if you go down the tokenization path. And I'm going to tell you more about that. Fantastic. I can't wait to see that. And then also just for our, our listeners who want to find out more about you, is it multifamilyu.com or would you send them anywhere else as well? It's simpler than that. I am the only Neil Bawa on the World Wide Web with this spelling N-E-A-L, last name Bawa, B-A-W-A. Hit enter on Google. Google likes me. So they have a massive amount of our content, especially the YouTube content is indexed. You can check out our websites. If you're an investor, you can you know check out. I'm sure one of the links is going to go to our website where you can see our 22 projects, our returns. What what are we doing? Why are we going into other asset classes like industrial and self storage and built to rent? These are asset classes that are absolutely fascinating. You know they're they're not bread and butter like multifamily, but right now they're like caviar. So check all of those out by just typing in Neil Bawa into Google. Fantastic. Well, Neil, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. You always bring so much informed material and data. And, and I really appreciate that. And, and I appreciate you talking about the disruptive trends, tokenization, suburbanization, and hybrid work, which was the, the main one. And plus the other ones you peppered in there. I really appreciate you having this conversation with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.